Jedi. They announced an HD port of Onimusha 1, but only the first game. <sighs> Capcom, what are you doing to me? At least I still have the other two games in the original trilogy right here. And maybe if I can ever get the equipment to do it properly, I'll cover these games at a later date. No promises, though. I have waited a long, long time to continue talking about the Onimusha series. And it was something I agonized over because I didn't know how I was going to make it possible because I didn't have the proper equipment to record PS2 games. And I've had people in the comments section of my original Onimusha video that you should still check out, by the way, who asked if I was ever going to get to it. But at this point, the only option I would have had was emulation. And for the longest time, I was opposed to it because I guess my old PC wasn't up for it because when I tried it, a lot of 3D elements were overlaid on top of the pre-rendered backgrounds incorrectly and everything wasn't lined up properly on top of that. So it was kind of off-putting to me and I just couldn't get the kind of quality I was happy with. But I made a new monster rig of a PC a little while back in TLDR, uh, it's doing exactly what I needed to do, so here we are today. Also, side note, I recently set up an account for retro achievements, which I think is a really cool thing that adds a bit of longevity to people playing their retro games. So if you're wondering what the pop-ups are during the footage in the video, then there you go. Now, as for my history with this game, I mentioned in my Onimusha 1 video that when I was a kid and got my first PS2, the only games I had at the time were Tokyo Extreme Racer Zero and the first Onimusha game that my cousin let me, so that's what put me on to the series. However, once you completed the original game, there was a trailer and the extra features that teased the follow-up game in the series. And since Semenosuke was supposedly missing in action at this point in time, it featured an all-new character. I was definitely excited to try it, but at 9 to 10 years old, I was, uh, as the kids say, broke as fuck. And I also wasn't really that savvy for game news, so it just kind of was out there and I had no idea when I was ever going to get a chance to play this game. Now my cousin was goaded for putting me onto Onimusha back in the day, but the real plug back in the day was a friend of my brother's named Justin. I wish I was making this up, but he used to come over to our house very often, usually multiple times a week, and he always came with, I shit you not, a bowling ball bag full of PS2 games. I don't think I talk about it enough, but I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, so the thought of this man walking around in broad daylight in the city with a bowling ball bag full of hundreds of dollars of PS2 games, this man was bold as fuck. And he was like my free personal blockbuster because he would always let me borrow one game at a time from the bag to try stuff out. It was low-key that scene from that one movie where John Cena was dealing drugs, but instead of John Cena dealing drugs, it was a blurred with PS2 games. And one day, out of this magical, world-expanding bowling ball bag, he pulled out two games that he had said just came out around the same time. Kingdom Hearts and Onimusha 2 Samurai's Destiny. You already know what choice I made here, but he also let my brother borrow Kingdom Hearts, so I got to play both of them. <laughs> now, depending on who you ask, which is like 90% of people who've played the Onimusha games, how they consider Onimusha 3 the best game of the series, and I agree, but we will get to that at uh, another point. Uh, I sometimes feel like Onimusha 2 is like that forgotten middle child of the series, so uh, I guess that's enough build up because today I'm here to talk to you about Onimusha 2 Samurai's Destiny. Hey, go try it, let's go! About eight years after Semenosuke defeated Fortinbra and disappeared after getting one good look at a freshly resurrected Nobunaga Oda, Nobunaga took over as the King of the Demons, and his first order of business was to wipe out those who would oppose him in this CG movie, which was honestly way more top tier than we deserved for something that was made in 2002. After seeing a village getting massacred, including dudes literally getting pinned to walls, followed by an ensemble of characters, which featured one girl showering in a waterfall for the horny bait, we are introduced to our main character, Jubei Yagyu. And the village that got destroyed? 
Yeah, that was his home, and they destroyed it while he was out training. Filled with a classic samurai burning desire for revenge, he's called to a nearby waterfall hiding a cave where he meets a floating spirit snake woman thing named Takajo, who subdues Jubei since he's hot and ready like a Little Caesars pizza that wants a little bit of vengeance. She activates a mark on his hand that will allow him to absorb demon souls, no not that one, and instructs him to find five magic orbs that will grant him the power to defeat Nobunaga, marked charity, faith, honesty, respect, and strength. And after giving him the charity orb, she drops this bombshell and then just leaves. You can do it, my son. What? What the fuck? Armed with the knowledge of who was behind the Yagyu Village Massacre and his first magic weapon, the Lightning Katana, Jubei vows to make Nobunaga pay. Following Takajo's instructions, he makes his way to Imasho, a village that's experiencing a gold rush and is attracting the kind of people who would rob a man that literally just died on the street, where Jubei hopes to find clues to help him on his journey. It's here that Jubei begins to meet all the other characters we saw in the intro. Firstly, he sees the woman in the intro rocking one of the magic orbs as a necklace before she takes off. Shortly after that, a spear-wielding warrior monk named Eke, a marksman named Magoichi who can't be bothered with any of the drama going on. He's my favorite and a ninja named Kotaro. Eke and Magoichi both join Jubei in exploring the mines on top of the village, but not before you get a permit thanks to this guy. I won't allow you to enter the mine unless you have a permit. Bro, all these people walking around with the dogs out and no helmets, but you want to bother me about regulations? I'll knock all this shit over. Be serious right now. Deep within the mines, we run into a guy saying he's looking for his daughter, which Eke gets all hot and bothered about because the guy says she's beautiful. God, keep it in your pants, man. Even further inside, we see Magoichi and Eke fighting because Eke dreams of becoming a feudal lord and Magoichi is trolling him about it. He asks what Jubei's dream is, to which Jubei says all I care about is vengeance. And Magoichi calls him another man possessed by a vengeful ghost. Moving on from that, even further in, you'll find this weird crab-like centaur guy, and after beating him in a fight, he says he'll be back. Afterwards, you don't find the woman or the missing daughter, but an injured man that you bring back to town, and as thanks, he gives you the key to the next section of the cave. On your second pass, you end up at the castle from the first game? What? At the castle gate, Magoichi finds you and tells you that the vengeful ghost bit from earlier was because Eke served a feudal lord that had lost some big battle, which cost Eke his wife and kid in the process. Then inside, you find the daughter, and it turns out she's an infant. Not in that emphasizing an age gap kind of way, but in that she's a literal fetus. Eke is probably drunk and starts tripping, saying that it's his daughter, recalling how his dream was a promise to his baby girl that he'd become a feudal lord, and he's just... clearly not okay? Look, everyone grieves in different ways, right? That's perfectly okay. That said, I recently heard someone say, your mental health is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And to be honest, I don't think he's handling things all that responsibly. Eventually, Jubei finds the woman being harassed by, Hey, I know that guy. It's that ratty troll dude from the first game. He takes off and you save the girl before running into this guy named Gogen. Gogen Dantis, the greatest swordsman of all demons. Yeah, it's about this point where the game starts leaning into godly levels of camp. And I mean, there was a little bit of that in the first game, but it was almost non-existent, I dare say. Meanwhile, in this game, you've got Eke being comedic relief fodder, that one centaur guy I mentioned earlier, and now this absolute ham just chewing up the scenery, proving he's equal part pomp and circumstance. Because even though Jubei starts acting like he's too cool for this Shakespearean-ass swordsman, he immediately puts Jubei on the back foot. The woman returns and bails Jubei out, with Gogen Dantas just letting it happen. She then gives Jubei the orb on her necklace, and they use it on this conveniently placed sphere that... ...turns into a metal horse? What? And they ride off into the night with this girl whose name we haven't even learned yet, but now she's staring at Jubei all... Back in Imasho, we learn her name is Oyu and that she's from Odani, a territory currently being raided by Nobunaga, so she came to kill him and quickly offers her aid to Jubei. As soon as she walks away though, Kotaro pops up and insists that something's off about Oyu, so he'll look into her. And back at the bar, one of your teammates tells Jubei that there's some woman looking for Jubei, and they start jesting that he's some kind of ladies man depending on who you're talking to, but the only thing he's horny right now for is revenge. I wonder who this lady is though. Hmm. Could it be the one in the market with the giant eyeball on her parasol? Look at me. Do you like what you see? Hmm? Oh, stranger danger. 
This demon lady says that she's going to kill Takajo, and if you already forgot who that was, it's Jubei Snake Mommy. I want to quickly add that I have some complaints regarding plot important names and things of that nature, but I'll put a pin in that, questions for later. We chase the demon lady back to Yagyu village, but fail to stop her from killing Takajo, and Jubei just lets her strut off laughing. Personally, I wouldn't let that slide, but as Takajo dies in Jubei's arms and Oyu shows up just to sit there awkwardly, Jubei talks about how when they first met, she told him about how she met Jubei's father and fell in love, had a baby, blah blah blah. Yeah, hi, question? When did this happen the first time they met? I was there. This didn't happen the way that they're saying it happened. Also, apparently Takajo was an Oni, so that makes Jubei half Oni, and it's his destiny to destroy the demons along with Nobunaga, hence the samurai's destiny in the title, which Jubei is again pretending by way of expositing to Oyu that we heard this the first time. I hate this. I do not like how unlinearly this game is progressing and expecting us to just smile and wave along with it. But whatever. We chase the demon lady up to some mountains where, depending on how you progressed this game, Kotaro helps Jubei get through some mirages in the forest, which unlocked a core memory for me because before re-experiencing this game, I thought Capcom only did this annoying ass gimmick in Devil May Cry 4. And thinking back on it, there's a lot of things in these games that made it into those games. I'll tackle that when we talk about Onimusha 3 eventually, but whatever. At least we get to play as another character for a few. After all of that, we get ambushed by the demon lady again, However, just as she readies up for a fight, she gets interrupted by the centaur guy. When you beat him the first time, despite him literally dissolving into, I don't know, like demon piss, he claimed he'd be back and now he is and he's claiming immortality. I feel like he should be a little bit higher up on the demon ladder if that were really the case, but also I only just learned that his name is Gingham Fats and that the lady's name is Juju Dorma. Learning this doesn't happen naturally, they're just... <laughs> It just happens to come out as these two argue over who gets to fight Jubei dialoguing like an old married couple from a sitcom or something. They're just bickering and the names just come flying out as if we knew these already. Which we didn't. More camp, less consideration for some kind of flow or natural exposition, but whatever. We knock out Gingham Fats and later take out Juju Dorma so that I never have to say those dumbass names out loud again, I hope, and get the third orb off of her. Then, immediately following that, her chamber starts filling with poison gas. Jubei escapes, jumping out into the nearby ocean to find another cave where there is another conveniently placed machine... swordfish... thing. We put the third orb into it, and it just beelines it to an island that's called the Oni Secret Place. As soon as we land, it turns out Gogandantis was hot on our trail just to challenge Jubei to another fight. And surprise, surprise, he wipes the floor with Jubei once again. Then Oyu shows up to defend him. Okay, I got more questions. How did she get here? Hell, how did she find here? Apparently that's not important though because she saves Jubei in just in time by getting in between the two, which Gogandantis gets annoyed by saying it's shameful to be saved by her twice or something like that. Hey, uh, Dantis, can I call you Dantis? Can you do me a favor and chill out with the random casual misogyny? I mean, we're trying not to hate you over here. Don't give us a reason, okay? Okay. Before he leaves though, he tells the pair that Nobunaga's army is about to sack Odani Castle, dares them to stop it, and then takes off. After which Oyu patches up Jubei and goes inside the secret place where she's greeted by Takajo's ghost. Only reason I'm not questioning this is because we've already seen from the previous game that the Oni communicate with people as spirits, so it's whatever, at least there's some kind of continuity there. She thanks Oyu for saving Jubei and instructs Oyu to find the sacred flute, an instrument that will weaken Gogandantis enough to allow Jubei to get the dub for once. The secret place has long since been taken over by the demons since the Oni went the way of the dodo bird, but she finds it and gives it to Jubei, who then goes inside and finds out more info about what the demons have been up to here, such as someone named Gildenstern researching the Oni tech here. But good luck figuring out who that is since this game loves throwing out names like you're just supposed to know them. They end up running into Ratman Hideyoshi again just for him to trap them in a cell. After all this, Oyu decides to fess up to Jubei thanks to recent events and Kotaro poking and prodding at her a bit on the side. Ignoring how he got here too and where he went after because I just don't have the patience, she reveals the truth about herself. Her real name is Oichi and she's from Asai and she's the wife of the Lord of Odani Castle and you ready for this one? The sister of Nobunaga. 
At this point, I'm going mentally numb, but Oyu's whole mission was to kill Nobunaga to save her family, including three daughters from her husband's past marriages that she didn't know about until after she tied the knot, which makes her resent her husband. Only now her not-so-secret crush on Jubei mixed with seeing how he dedicates himself to the mission his family left him with causes Oyu to say that she's being selfish because her stepdaughters are waiting for her. She starts crying, so Jubei starts to comfort her and... Wait, are they gonna kiss? Are we getting a little romance here? can't have shit in here, damn! So now the secret place is exploding, as Jubei and Oyu try to escape, before Oyu gets hit with an explosion and almost falls to her death. In the nick of time though, she gets saved by Gogan Dantes. Hey, way to go Dantes, guess I could let that whole sexism thing from earlier go- You don't have to be thankful. It is quite natural for men to save weak women. Just play the flute. Now that he's weakened to a beatable level, we finally take him out, and as he's dying, he shares a Heisenberg moment with Jubei. Tell me my name. Your name is... Gogan Dantes, the greatest swordsman of all the demons. He gives Jubei the fourth orb before he bites it, and we use it to activate a statue that summons a big airship that Ratman hijacks to go attack Odani Castle. So then the two get ready to give chase on this big machine firefly hang glider thing. But first we have to get this stupid gate open. Damn it. We get onto the airship and make it to the bridge just for Stuart Little here to book it. The duo take control of the bridge and carpet bombs Nobunaga's army. And then they crash land the ship back at Nobunaga's castle just for Oyu to fail to get off the ship and she falls in it as it explodes. Jubei gets to the top and opens up the way to Nobunaga's demon tower on the side of the castle. Inside, we end up in one last fight with Gingham Fats, and once again boasting about being immortal or whatever, but when we take him out, seemingly for good this time because he falls into a fire pit in the center of the room. Oh, now Jubei wants to make jokes. <laughs> whatever. Just in time for the finale, we get the final orb, which was in Gingham Fats' hammer, and as we approach the elevator to Nobunaga's chamber, Oyu shows up. I don't know how she survives falling inside the exploding airship, but who cares, because we get this scene where they finally kiss. We did it! Or maybe not, but I'll get into that later. We leave Oyu and square up with Nobunaga, who has dumped most of his power into this big gold statue. I totally forgot to mention this, because up until now, so did the game. They, they never bring it up in any conversations, but you can find a note at some point midway where they mention this being a really big deal, so here we are, I guess. Nobunaga turns up out the gate and transforms into his demon form and we fight. It is a really tough fight, with him using magic elements just like you, but with enough work, we take him down. Except no, we don't, because this happens. You will die. What the fuck is even happening anymore? <laughs> So Nobunaga basically becomes the gold statue, and Jubei finally remembers that we spent the entire game collecting those magic orbs, so he uses them and basically does like a Kamen Rider Henshin thing and transforms into a demonic Mega Man, which I feel is a little random until you remember whose name was right there in the opening credits. Oh, Keiji and Afune, they were giving you too much credit back in the day. The effect this man had on Capcom in the 2000s needs to be studied. Oh wait, never mind. Well, we end up mega busting the gold statue in some weird alternate dimension, which goes on for a little long by the time he starts shooting baby face masks at you, but you succeed. Nobunaga reforms as the eclipse in the background, claiming that he will rise again, and instead of Oni Jubei going nuh uh and erasing him, it cuts to him running as the tower falls. Roll credits. So, upon revisiting this game, this plot makes so little sense. <laughs> it's just so disjointed at times that it's kind of jarring. It's also kind of funny in that way because nobody in this plot is asking any questions that actually matter, I think. I'd wager that that's because this whole plot feels more bloated and experimental than the first game, and that's not just for the things I outlined already, but for the things I left out. At the end of the credits, you see a timeline of the story, and you'll quickly notice that there may be a lot of things you didn't see that are grayed out on the chart. And that's because you have to build a relationship with each of the characters in order to make some of these things happen. Upon your arrival to Imasho and meeting the other characters, you're introduced to a gift giving mechanic where you can find and buy items with money you get from the enemies and throughout the mines. And it's implied that you become closer with them depending on what you give them. Here's the problem with that though. 
there's no indicator as to how effective each gift is. You have to infer from what little you know about these people what kind of gift they would appreciate. And while there are items like equipment that are clearly marked for a specific person, there are many more items that are not. And there's no gauge for your bonds, so you have no idea how far along you are with any of these people at any point. And all that happens is that they'll comment on the gift and you get a little text about their reaction to it. Not all of these, to me, are very clear about how much they actually like the gift and there's no kind of number scoring or anything of the sort to tell you how you're getting on with them. I've seen some old guides that have tried to quantify this, but I honestly don't think the ones I've seen are all that good for the most part because there's been times that the reactions I've gotten were the complete opposite of what I was being told they would be. Some gifts can even be outright refused if they don't like them enough. I get this the most from Eke because outside of his equipment and liquor, I cannot for the life of me figure out what to give him half the time. Regardless, accepted gifts are reciprocated with useful items or things that you can re-gift to other characters. And if you're on the right track, then they may occasionally show up during fights and also maybe will eventually unlock additional scenarios. And depending on how these things play out, you can play as each character for a short section, making use of all the equipment that you were gifting. I like these sections because each character has a different playstyle, and unlike Kaede from the first game, each character is given a bracelet that lets them absorb the demon souls, and it makes them more interesting to play as because I don't feel like I have to skip this section or that like I'm just inherently weaker than the main character no matter how short the section is. And when you finish those sections, they give the bracelets to Jubei, which lets him collect all of the souls that they took, which will help you keep up to snuff when you had a little extended section away from him. But all of these mechanics, the, the gift giving, the money, and the store, the bonding, almost all of it completely disappears as soon as Juju Dorma shows up and says that she's gonna kill Takajo, because after that, you almost like are completely removed from the any of those mechanics and only have like certain scenarios in which you get to interact with the characters. And if you hadn't bonded enough to get the assist during fights, you'll never see these characters again when you leave Imasho behind, and there's some good material you can miss out once that happens. For example, Eke's story ends tragically at the 11th hour when he forces Jubei to fight him and you end up killing him because he was offered the chance to become a feudal lord in exchange for Jubei's life. But you'll likely never see Eke again after heading to the mountains if you didn't bond enough. There, like Another example is there's a section where you see a bunch of petrified people and some are blocking your path and if you bonded enough with Maguichi, Jubei gets petrified by old rat boy here and he has to find a supposed cure to save him. Then he hands the cure to Jubei allowing him to proceed through the area. If you miss this, Jubei just finds it and proceeds uninterrupted. That whole thing with kissing Oyu at the end? Yeah, that's 50-50. If you don't bond enough with her, Jubei just says goodbye to her and you miss out on any kind of payoff for a whole game's worth of weird romantic tension. And if you do get it, you also get an end credit scene where Jubei finds Ou after the battle with Nobunaga. Kotaro shares interactions with her too, and you'll miss those two if you don't interact with them both. There's a whole bunch more I'm not even covering, and it's a shame to me that it's not clearer how to make a lot of this stuff happen because for the most part, I enjoy interacting with these characters. Especially Magoichi, who otherwise does not give a single fuck about anything going on here. I mean, look at him. His energy is unmatched. This is why he's my favorite. <laughs> There's a lot of missteps with this approach that makes so many things feel disjointed as I said before, but I want to have these interactions, which is what honestly makes the game replayable due to this setup, because otherwise I am not interested in the void of charisma that is Jubei. He has a sympathetic, if a little cliche, motivation and all that, but he's just so... dull on his own. He's short on words in most conversations, and his whole tone is this corny, like, Christian Bale, I'm too cool for this energy. He can literally look you dead in the eyes and you will feel the thousand yard stare. Which is crazy for his character because his face is modeled on that of Yusaku Matsuda, who uh, was apparently such a cool iconic person in real life that he was the inspiration of Spike fucking Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. And they used archival footage to have him voice Jubei in the Japanese dub, which, I mean, it's kind of giving the same energy. Like, I I've never really watched any of Matsuda's work, so like that was, you know, funny to me. Honestly makes me wonder how they even pulled off that deal, considering that Matsuda died before I was even born, but it also, in retrospect, makes me think the legal circus that probably circles his likeness rights has something to do with why they didn't drop a remaster of the entire trilogy back in 2018. I figure they can still talk to Takeshi Kaneshiro about his role as Semenosuke, and I don't know what Jean Renault would say about bringing his face model back for Jacques in Onimusha 3, but I'm going on a tangent. My point is that Semenosuke was kinda stoic too, but at least there was still some personality there. He was like a, like a cool cool, warm, like, understanding dude who was just, like, like, strong of character or whatever. Jubei just has drip in a deep voice. We must have faith. 
Anyway, we must do whatever we can to stop Oda's army. Thankfully, Onimusha 2 is still a great play, and built up from the first game in notable ways. The combat fundamentals and tank controls are still largely the same as the first, and you still have the whole upgrade system with the demon souls to power up your weapons as well as your armor this time, replacing the swappable armor sets from the first game. And of course, the Isen counter is still the most satisfying counter I've ever used in a video game. God, it's so good. But it's like Capcom heard us all wanting to be able to control the Oni form from the last cutscene of the first game, because that's a mechanic here too. Occasionally, enemies will let out these large purple souls, absorb five of these, and you transform into an Onimusha, the Oni warrior. When you do, you have the energy to clear entire rooms of enemies, but if there's one complaint to be had, it's that you can't stock this. The second you absorb the fifth soul, you transform on the spot. And that leads me to often avoiding them when they pop up, because if you can imagine, it's real inconvenient if you were to absorb this when there's only like one more enemy in the room and now you're just sitting there like a badass goofball who whiffed his ult. Jubei has really good weapons too. I mean, he gets the lightning sword as I mentioned before, bringing some familiarity to the kit early on, and he also gets the wind naginata too, but his second weapon in order is an ice spear that gives him a lot more reach and the magic attack can make enemies shatter on the spot. And his last main weapon is an earth hammer that's so powerful it makes it an earthquake for a magic attack and the downswing just makes the entire screen shake you can feel the weight on this one its combo is a two hitter quitter that makes you feel the weight of the weapon like i said and lastly jubei's ultimate weapon is the fire great sword which is a little lame in comparison to samonosuke's bishamon sword because the magic attack is effectively the same but you don't even get infinite magic with it one other thing that jubei has in his arsenal is secret techniques Every weapon now has this thing where when you lock onto an enemy, it charges energy. Attack when it's charged, and each weapon lets out some really good combos. And a bunch of these are good for crowd control too. You'll find scrolls throughout the game that level these up too, and some of them are through the gift exchange mechanic also. And when you have the level 3 of each of these, a full charge lets out a whole pre-programmed combo that can make quick work of even the biggest enemies. There's a lot more options for dispatching enemies in this. There's more variety in the environments too. As I've already mentioned, there are plenty of locales in this game that offer a lot more variety visually than the entirety of one single castle like the first game. There's a lot of different musical motifs, some atmospheric and some epic. Imasho for one feels pretty alive thanks to all the characters going about their day combined with the music giving the town the feeling of a bustling little trade town. And the voice acting still isn't that great in the English dub. I mean, Jubei, like I said, he sounds like he's practicing his Batman voice, and Eke's line delivery is weird sometimes, on top of him just being loud and annoying. Makoichi! Where did you take my girl? How dare you disturb our time! Together! Seriously? Who'd want a red bald head like you? A red bald head! <laughs> <laughs> Outside now! But I think that's kind of the point of his character anyway, so I digress. But it is more than what the first game offered, so I won't be too harsh on it. It's just worth noting time and again how far we've come since these days. Ultimately, I think that's a pretty good summary of everything when it comes to Onimusha 2. It's very weird, and everything doesn't land while feeling disjointed and bloated at the same time. However, fundamentally, it is better than the first in a number of ways that do matter, even if it's often overshadowed by what follows it. And it's crazy to think that I had this much to say about a game that only took me about six, seven-ish hours to beat. I am very glad to have finally been able to talk about this game on the channel. It's been clawing at the back of my mind for a couple of years now. Feels good to get that out. And who knows, Capcom has been gauging interest for older series to return, so I can only hope they consider bringing back this series because, let me tell you, that Netflix show was not it. <laughs> that aside, I might have some other classics I want to talk to you about in the future, but for now, what is your opinion of Onimusha 2? Feel free to drop a comment and let's discuss, and maybe leave a like and comment along the way? I'd like that. And before I sign off, I want to shout out my patrons, specifically Quinn McGaming. Thank you for the support. And if you want, you can check the link in the description to find the One Sleepy Giant Patreon. Come join the Sleepy City crew. We accept all kinds. All right, though. But for real, though, until next time, y'all know what's up. My name is Hector, and I'm One Sleepy Giant. I had a lot of fun, but I got to hit the sack. So I'll talk to you guys later. Take care of yourselves.